Here we're going to investigate plant hormones in the general sense. I'm just giving an overview of the impact that certain ones can have. As you can see in the picture here, hormones can impact plant behavior dramatically if used in the right amounts. So hormones in general. Hormones are organic substances produced in small amounts that regulate or coordinate metabolism, growth, and morphogenesis. There's a couple listed here, which I'll have separate videos on to describe in more detail. Cytokinins can induce the growth of the shoots. Auxins can promote root initiation. Gibberellins can stimulate stem elongation. And others can trigger um, blossoming. We're not going to focus on this one too much here. Uh, we're also going to go over abscisic acid. So basic hormone processing, just in the general sense, we're looking at a receptor that binds. We have this hormone. Again, there's small amounts, but they're binding to a specific receptor. Then there's signal transduction, and these are relay molecules. The number of molecule at, molecules activated can be increased exponentially. This is why hormones are needed in such small amounts, because they can initiate a large response through relay molecules. These relay molecules can then impact a cellular response by affecting the DNA expression in this case. Cell activity is initiated indirectly via the action of secondary messengers. Notice this small round molecule is able to get through the pore of the nucleus and adjust the cellular response by adjusting the gene regulation. Now we have some different examples here of different types of hormones. Keep in mind there's two key um, categories. There's lipid soluble hormones or steroid hormones. Give the details here. Key part is these are able to go through the phospholipid bilayer and enter the inner part of the cell. And they can directly initiate the production of proteins within a target cell because they easily diffuse that cellular membrane. The, ho the hormone cells to bind a receptor in the cytosol and that forms a receptor hormone complex. Receptor hormone complex then enters the nucleus, okay, here, and that can bind to the target gene of the DNA. Transcription of the gene creates messenger RNA that's then translated to the desired protein within the cytoplasm. Lipid-soluble hormones, those are all considered steroids. Now other ones are water-soluble hormones, and they have a little bit of a different process. Water-soluble hormones can't diffuse through the cell membrane. These hormones must bind to a surface membrane receptor, see here. The receptor then initiates a cell signaling pathway within the cell involving proteins. These protein kinases phosphorylate proteins in the cytoplasm. This activates the proteins in the cell that carry out the charges specified by the hormone. So there's a little bit of an extra binding site that needs to occur on the external surface because water-soluble hormones can't go through the phospholipid bilayer. Those lipids, remember those tails, are hydrophobic and they will repel that. So these proteins need to bind to a surface protein receptor. Here, steroid hormones are able to go right through. Water-soluble ones need that extra receptor binding complex. This then shows it again, the lipid-soluble hormones. You see here, an example of animals would be, you know, probably a little bit easier to relate to. But the same thing occurs in plants. Lipid-soluble can diffuse right through the membrane. The hormones bind to receptor in the cytoplasm. The receptor hormone complex enters the nucleus and adjusting gene regulation. That gene re regulation is related to transcription, ultimately translation, resulting in an activated protein. Water-soluble hormones, on the other hand, these need to bind to the exterior surface. These bind with the protein complex, and you can see in a roundabout way, they are also producing activated proteins, but they have a little bit of a different pathway. <clears throat> that protein kinase, activated protein kinase, requiring ATP, and that phosphorylation that's occurring is generating the proteins within the cytoplasm. We notice here we're seeing transcription translation with actual DNA and gene regulation. Here we're kind of sidestepping the nucleus, and we're just generating our activated proteins within the cytoplasm. The five major classes of plant hormones that we're going to be discussing are auxins, typically for shoot apical meristems, and that's where they're typically found. They're for stimulation, elongation, vascular tissue, and lateral buds. Cytokinins, they're produced in the roots and transported from there. They interact with auxins, they, set, they stimulate cell division. Gibberellins, they can be in apical portions, and they're responsible for like seed germination and um, internode elongation. Ethylene is in leaves and stems and young fruits. Concerns abscission, which is the dropping of leaves, the flowering of fruits, and fruit ripening. And abscisic acid, mature leaves and root caps is where it's produced, and it can suppress bud growth. It's also important for stomatal opening. 
This gives you a quick overview of hormones and their function and where they may be found at different sequences of the plant. You notice for germination, only gibberellins are really the most active. Where when we look at flowering and fruit development, pretty much everything but abscisic acid is involved in some way. Abscisic acid is key for seed dormancy. A little bit for abscission with ethylene also plays a role in that. So you can see that just one hormone isn't doing just one task. It can be involved in multiple different tasks. And we're going to learn about each of these in a little bit more detail so you can appreciate some of the specifics that these different hormones and their ratios and concentrations can impact plant growth.